the uh, GPS uh, load monitoring company. Uh, I'm an applied sports scientist with them. Uh, I mainly work with our hockey clients. So any of our ice hockey clients uh, in North America are, are kind of who I help, uh, mainly from a uh, data understanding and application perspective. Uh, the second role that I have is uh, I'm the manager for performance of Hockey Canada. So uh, I oversee our men's and women's high performance programs, uh, all the way from our under 18 uh, through to our national team on our women's side, and then mainly um, provide some knowledge with our under 17s through our under 18s to our under 20 or world junior program um, on our men's side. Pretty diverse. How did you get into hockey in the first place? Uh, well, I think being in Canada, it's just something that uh, you know most people are bound to bound to think of. But uh, I actually um, I played hockey, but more on a recreation um, perspective side of things. I uh, I played football, like American football. That was kind of kind of my sport. And um, I remember in my third year of university, I did an internship down in the states because. Uh, strength and conditioning was such a just a growing field back then in the early 2000s and obviously it was it was bigger in the U.S. than it was up here in Canada but I remember uh, our internship coordinator said to me um, you know if you if you want to stay in Canada you better learn and understand hockey so uh, I did that and uh, kind of dove right in and uh, was fortunate to meet a lot of people along the way and kind of grow your network and, and just uh, you know got a lot of opportunities I worked with Hockey Canada now for over 10 years which is our Third, okay. third quadrennial for the Olympics that we're we're prepping and planning for. So, uh, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that's the highest we can get uh, from amateur sport wise here and in, uh, in, in Canada with that group. And it's great, you know. I'm, I'm fortunate in that I get different coaches year after year. Um, so I kind of am a nice constant with our tournament teams and, and uh, you know need to set kind of that physical performance pillar um, year over year. Sounds good. So with the, the lockdown situation in Canada, how have your athletes been coping with the training and stuff? Um, well, it's all remote. Uh, so we're a decentralized mm-hmm. program anyway. Um, the biggest hit to our athletes was uh, they canceled three of our, our uh, world championships. So our women's, yeah. our women's program, uh, they were um, hosting in Canada. So it felt really, really bad for them. They were one of the first ones that unfortunately had to be canceled because of this. Uh, our under-18 men and our, our men's world teams, they, they uh, canceled their tournaments as well. But, you know, uh, it would be off-season for our athletes anyway. So uh, yeah. we've just had to cope with at-home training. So uh, being a lot more, uh, giving them a lot more leeway and flexibility within what they're doing has, has been really key for us because, you know, you're, you're home 24 hours a day. We want them to not feel like they can only train or only do what we say. So we've really uh let them grow a little bit you know dabbling in yoga or mobility sessions we lead um one or two sessions a week for the athletes just kind of online and zoom call but um you know fortunately the athletes that i get to work with are really driven so they want to there's that want to train versus they have to train yeah that's it definitely good when you're when you're at home on your own you need to have that desire to do it yourself don't you definitely yeah so do you, do you normally do like off ice conditioning when it's normal season time as well? Uh, we do, um, not as much. We really try to um, get the bulk of the conditioning done on ice. Really, you know that sports specific model of preparation. Yeah. Uh, really hitting the athletes uh, uh, with their energy system work on the ice, and um, we will do obviously, especially during the summer. It's, tough to get ice so most of our off-season conditioning is running sprint based uh, and some bike work um, but in season unless there's a true deficiency like an aerobic deficiency uh, with yeah. an athlete we try to uh, push as much on ice specificity as we can okay and is that the same for athletes at every, every single stage do they they go straight onto the ice as soon as they start basically. well if it was up to the athletes they would never leave the ice um okay. but uh you know it's one of those things so hockey suffers a little bit in that um it's deeply rooted in tradition a lot and so uh you know my role and a lot of the people that i work with up here our job is to help educate the coaches from a grassroots level all the way up and, okay and really uh i think it's come a long way you know it's it's um it's hard to get the message out that ath- that hockey athletes just don't need to go run. You know, we really want to <laughs> okay. focus on uh, 
uh, you know, some short sprints, some intensity, um, you know, repeat sprint stuff. And, and really, um, a lot of what I've tried to do recently is really flip our coaches' mentality of practice preparation to intensity, not volume. Okay. You know, a lot of a lot of hockey coaches will think, well, I've got 60 minutes of ice time booked. I need to use all 60 minutes. Well, I always say, well, you might have booked 60 minutes, but if you can accomplish what you need uh, in a less amount of time by working the athletes at a higher intensity, that will be better in the long run. You know, we, we know that we can get athletes closer to games advanced that way. Uh, and, and we'll get a better uh, physiological response if we push them harder than, you know, push them longer at a lower intensity. Yeah, for sure. It's more efficient as well. Yeah. So do you do you combine the, the catapult side of your, your work with your, your hockey work too? So to, to monitor and to, uh, yeah, to monitor the athletes and things? Yeah, so Hockey Can has been using on-ice mode monitoring tools for the last five years. Um, it's mm-hmm. been a really big... Uh, culture shift over those years based off some of the information we found just from a, a practice planning um, uh, perspective. And, and uh, it's been great uh, to provide that feedback back to our coaches. You know, in in North America, and, and I would say hockey in general, it's very much uh, top-down driven, meaning the head coach okay. uh, plans everything. But uh, we've had great success kind of infiltrating the planning process of, of the coaches. And Really, yeah. it's not telling them what to do, but it's just providing them the information so they can uh, plan better practices around whatever the physical preparation goal of the day is. Okay, how do you find that getting the, the kind of data that can be quite confusing, how do you get that across to coaches who are quite time poor and may not want to listen? So how do you how do you achieve that, get over that barrier? Yeah, that's like the million dollar question. Uh, you know, every <laughs> coaching staff wants to see th- things a little bit different and uh, really, I, I always just try to tell coaches there's a there's a trade off between volume and intensity. You can't go hard for a long period of time and uh, show them that. So show them throughout the course of a session what happens the longer we go, um, but also the impact of doing too much. And and that's been a big thing that I've tried to work with coaches is we don't have to do something all the time just for the sake of accomplishing something. You know, we need to work hard. We need to work purposeful. Um, so taking that, whether it's showing them the amount of work we've done over uh, the last week uh, or mm-hmm. showing them that, you know, our, our players have done two or three days, two or three games worth over the last five days. Is that really what you wanted to accomplish four or five days out yeah. from our world championship? And, and really, um, Again, you know, coming back to that intensity piece is, is I want us to increase our intensity, drop our volume, because we know we can have a, we can elicit a better outcome that closer matches the game demands. And, and um, that's been, you know, as I said, over the last few years, it's been a big, uh, a big piece for our, our coaches to understand. Um, yeah. Because we, like uh, load monitoring in hockey is still relatively new. It's only really been over the last three to five years that it's actually been something. Uh, okay. It was just perception up to that. You know, coach coach's perception of if that day was easy or hard. And we know through research that doesn't always – coach perception and athlete perception of practice don't match, which is, you know, one of the key proponents of external load monitoring. Okay. So, I mean, you're talking about research. Do you do research as well as your other two things? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I just – finished uh so uh i finished working on my phd from york university here in toronto uh, last november so uh up until that point i was doing a lot Uh, i still i still dabble here and there you know um uh, i'm i I work with a lot of uh other phd students just to kind of help guide them through the process um I still have a paper that I'm currently in the review process and in that cycle, so I'm still in, yeah. I'm still yeah. in it that way. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I really enjoy it, just the, applying the scientific principles to uh, a sport that doesn't have a lot of scientific principles attached to it, and and bringing um, some of the concepts that you learn just of critical thinking and thought and questioning things and, and trying to ask those questions within the teams and the sports that I work with. Um, so it is something I really, really enjoy doing and, and hockey is a very under-researched sport. 
in the global sports term. You know, there's there's been a lot of work done in heart rate. There's been a lot of work done in, in uh, hydration with hockey, kind of the easy things you can measure. The world yeah. of load monitoring, like when I started my PhD four and a half years ago, um, there was one paper using uh, external load monitoring in ice hockey. That was it. So uh, really, you know, kind of could fill a niche. And now since then, you know, I, I uh, fortunately have published three papers on it. Um, there's a few more that have gone out from colleagues. And so it's slowly starting to to burn. And, and the next step that I like to take things are those performance-based questions. You know, we can look at at soccer and Aussie rules football and some of the great work that uh, applied uh, researchers have done using those sport demands and performance. And that's hopefully where, I, where I'm trying to take hockey, uh, hockey research over here. Cool. So you're, you're planning to do more research at some point, just like so. when you have time. Yeah, I hope I'm so. busy. You know, I always, I always look at projects. You know, I always have the, the nice part is I always have data to look at. So um, yeah. whether that uh, whether those that research will ever make it to publication, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I really like com having conversations with coaches about, you know, performance problem X. And can we yeah. can we answer that from our wearable data? OK, interesting. So going back to the, the hockey training context, yeah. out of the hit formats, which of those do you use most frequently? I guess you were saying like the, the shorter intervals and things. Yeah, so for so us. Um, and, and I got to give credit to, uh, my colleague, Matt Nickel, who, who did the, uh, who wrote the textbook chapter. And then I, I kind of uh, put together the, the presentation and, you know, from, from what we, we put together there really, you could say 90% of the hit work is going to be, um, the short interval training or the sprint interval training yeah. story and the, uh, repeat sprint. So you know, really, truly, if we want to talk about hockey, and, and I kind of touched on it earlier, but, you know, if we talk about like the similar movement patterns and, and the work that, that is done on the ice, you know, it's, it's an alactic dominant, uh, hard, rapid acceleration D cells, and it's unplanned and reactive. You know, you're, it's one of the fastest sports on earth, and, and you're chasing around a puck with uh, nine other mm -hmm. bodies on the ice. So, um, you know, certainly the 70% is about that type five. Um, where, yeah. where we look at like the 20 seconds on, two minute off, that really, really hard, intense intervals. And then, the, the, you know, we drop the, the percentage of, a lot to about 20% for the repeat sprint, where, you know, we just manipulate that work to rest uh, ratio a little bit further. Okay. And then what about the, is it goaltenders? I think they're called. Cool. Yeah, the goaltenders. Yeah. yeah. What about their training? Yeah, see, well, I, I knew the lingo. But yeah, what about their training? How does that differ? Uh, it does differ the, entirely because. You know, uh, a few things, uh, I guess, are different for them. We need, still need to do a lot of the sit work with them at type five because mm -hmm. they, they play such an explosive position. Uh, you know, they're trying to stop that rubber puck that comes at them over 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, so they need to be really explosive, really rapid with that. But the one thing I try to focus on with our coaches is a little bit more of the um, hit long, especially early in the off season, because they're the okay. only player that plays a full game. You know, certainly okay. they, they have a lot of uh, periods of lower intensity, but for them, um, you know, they need to be focused and engaged for that whole 60 minute game. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for them as well, it's probably the psychological aspects trying to train that as well. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough for goalies because they don't have the same movement demands that skaters have. They don't cover the same ground but they need to be probably one of the most explosive people on the ice and close to one of the fittest. And, and they need to be able to handle those different demands of just being engaged for a lot longer of, of the, of the game. Yeah. Interesting. So in terms of you, you were mentioning monitoring earlier. So how do you monitor like the recovery status of the different athletes? And then when do you do that as well? Yeah. So, um, with our women's program, they wear hurry monitors as well. So we can get the internal external load, which is really nice. And over the course of a tournament and, and a month uh, to two month process that we have them leading in, um, we can look at changes in their internal and external load um, using trim. So we use trim. Um, uh, I've also done some work with um, heart rate variability, uh, kind of longer term. Uh, I really like to look at resting heart rate in the morning. So uh, we found that as a really good uh, indicator of kind of recovery in that internal load. Uh, and those are just nice things to track over time. You know, even though we're decentralized, we have a nice, um, 
nice block of time beforehand to really get some normative data before the tournament starts and then uh, monitor any individual changes in that as the tournament progresses to then step in and help, whether it's more recovery, nutritional interventions, uh, work rest intervals, that sort of thing. Do you, do you use nutrition as well as, as um, when you're doing the HIIT training? Do you incorporate that into to manipulating how the physiological demands change? Not really. You know, we have uh, some dietitians. We're fortunate enough that within our, our NSO, we have some dietitians that do some great work with our athletes. You know, really, uh, we find that most of our athletes need to uh, increase their carbohydrate intake um, to mm -hmm. aid in that recovery, just like most athletes. Um, I wouldn't say we use it as a specific a variable that we manipulate, but um, yeah. you know the group that I work most closely with is our under twenty uh, men's team, and we just need those guys to eat. They they burn so many calories uh, when we're training and when we're when they're competing that uh, we just a lot of times you know you don't you think about teenage teenage boys they, they don't need to eat more, but we really have to get these guys eating because. Uh, you know, they're just little little furnaces and factories when they're on the ice. Do you monitor their recovery as well? At what like what age or what stage of development do you start doing those kind of things? Uh, athletes usually come in hockey in around sixteen years old. Um, I don't okay. really truly get my hands on them until they're out of that first kind of introductory program uh, to uh, to the under seventeen uh, out of the under seventeen into the under eighteen under twenty kind of stream. Uh, on our women's side, uh, we identify athletes uh, around uh, 16, 16, 17 years old, and we can have them almost all the way through until they're 30 plus. Um, oh, wow. So, so we do a lot more longitudinal monitoring, a lot more athlete profiling on our women's side because they just don't have the same um, uh, professional structure, professional clubs that monitor their athletes as much as they do. So our women, like we have testing data for 20 plus years on some of our athletes, uh, which is amazing. We've been able to do some uh, great stuff with those athletes when it comes to individualization for performance. I mean, there's papers there, plenty of papers you can write with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so in terms of like monitoring, um, looking at their kind of responses to training, do you use any testing um, to do that, to assess how they're, how they're adapting to their, their training in general? Yeah, most of our, our testing battery uh, has been pretty set um, just because uh, we're a well-established program and we have lots of longitudinal data. We don't, uh, we don't necessarily uh, change that much because we don't want to throw out all that other stuff. So over the years, we've kind of uh, massaged things here and there. But, um, you know, typically it's typical with a, kind of any off-ice testing uh, battery that you do. You know, we do our jump testing. We do our wing gates. We do a, an incremental uh, bike test, VO2s, um, isometric mid-thigh pull. Uh, you know, one of the things we've really started to move uh, towards over probably the last six years is, is more sprint-based training. Uh, so we do a 10-meter sprint, a 505, and then we actually do a repeat uh, anaerobic sprint tester. It's called the RAP. Uh, and we've really found that... Um, you know, it's one of those things that once you, we've started to kind of include it in our testing battery, we've seen great improvements on the ice. And, and we really needed to work on speed and, and our athletes. That's been a big focus, a big key performance indicator for us and our coaching staff is, is to improve the on-ice speed work. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, gotten, the athletes have gotten faster and since we've had that test. And, then, you know, you can argue that athletes get faster because we're testing it, but, you know, really that's been the focus over the last six years of our off-ice um, S&C program. Okay. Uh, yeah, so getting some questions through. So um, in terms of, like, in addition to the off-ice, on-ice training, do you also incorporate strength training into the into the program? Yeah, you know, our athletes, uh, they, they, they're they well-oiled machines, and, um, you know, just like any any high level athlete, you know, the development of strength is important. You know, I, I'm an athlete that I, or I'm a strength coach at my philosophy is I really try to chase strength with a, with a lot of our female athletes. And, and I, it's a big believer of mine in that the strength underpins any of our, our power speed outputs that we want. So for me, um, you know, I, I really like to do some really focused strength blocks. Uh, I'm fairly traditional in that matter. Um, you know, uh, 
just like the, the nice part about hockey is it, the off season allows for a nice periodized plan as you go. So if we think of like our general prep, then we can work some strength, then we can work some power, and then we can transition that into our, our speed or our speed endurance or sports specific training. Um, and the, the off season is set up nicely for that. So uh, from a general principle perspective, you know, I think uh, strength underpins everything. And then uh, that sets us up nice for our, our power and speed work, which has been our focus. And, and the nice part about having athletes uh, in our program, in our women's program for for years, is, is they've been able to develop a lot of that strength. And so um, that's been a big focus for our younger female athletes is to don't be a, don't be afraid of strength training and, and really work to get stronger because then as they move to our national program, then we can use that strength they built to, to help them with their output of power and speed. Okay, so again, when at what stage do they start doing the strength training? Is it is it all the way through or? Well, up here yeah. in Canada, we have like the hockey is such a big business uh, outside of Hockey Canada that you know we're finding our athletes are our hockey athletes are starting to train as as young as 12, 13 in structured strength and conditioning programs. You know, movement based foundations, body weight awareness, uh, you know, some agility based stuff. But uh, you know, over my my ten years the athletes are further along in that in our under 17 and our under 18 program than they ever have before so a lot of what we try to do is we try to educate them on what their training plans would look like when they are training with other people and and really work just on cleaning up some of their stuff um, so when they do kind of enter our program full time um, you know we know that they have that base foundation then we can start working on some of the specific stuff that that specific deficiencies or specific areas that we want to improve based off our testing battery. Okay, sounds sounds good. So like do they they initially start remotely and then they come in or do they are they stay remote the whole time? Uh, we're How remote we are um, we're remote the whole time except the year um, before the Olympics with our women's program. So the year before our Olympics program, uh, the Olympics, that program will centralize. So they'll all move to okay. a hub city, typically Calgary or somewhere out west. And they will train and play together for the uh, eight months leading into the games. Okay, so when's the next? Uh, I guess the Olympics is the main thing. But is there a, when's the next kind of competition phase for the athletes? So uh, they just uh, unfortunately missed their World Championships in uh, beginning of April. So this is now their current off season. So we're we're looking hopefully for a September or October training camp. So what we try okay. to do is we try to have. Uh, kind of four or five day training camps once a month, bring that group together, allow them to skate and play a few games together, allow them to train together before they split off again. So uh, barring uh, the continuation of the current global situation, we've got our fingers crossed that we can all get back together in person around the end of September or October. Okay, that sounds good. So then the next, when's the next Winter Olympics? Uh, uh, it's Beijing in 2022. Okay, so it's not too far. Either. Not not okay. too far away. Uh, so yeah. uh, we really started to dial that group in. Uh, you know, we start with a, a bigger pool. That that roster doesn't the Olympic roster doesn't get named for a year or so. But you know, we've really started to to dial that group in. Start working really closely with the coaches. Start feeding them information back to you know what we think is important from a an on ice perspective, and then go from there. Okay, and so for that. Those individuals that will be will be playing in the Olympics or in big games. What what are the factors that help them to win? What what do you look for? What do you look to develop in them? Um. Well, to to win in big games, one of the interesting and it was actually one of the papers that I wrote, uh, more of a case study uh, for my PhD work, was looking at at if any of the you know, external load variables had an impact on, on game outcomes, so win-loss. And really what we found was, and it kind of was the whole general theme of what I was studying, but a lot of the metrics based off intensity were higher for forwards, meaning, you know, we, we worked harder or we worked at a higher intensity in, in games we won. And so that's one of the things is we try to build this resilience, what we call tournament durability, where the, the physical you know, needs or physical performance can match the tech tact, technical and tactical outcomes that the coaches want. Um, so, you know, the ability to to have those rapid bursts of high intensity, the ability to repeat that over the course of a, a game is really important. You know, athletes will have anywhere from, you know, 
potentially 20 to 30 shifts of anywhere from 30 to uh, 75 seconds in length. And so we need them to, to have that outcome and be able to repeat that anytime they hit the ice because hockey is such a variable sport. There's so many things that can go into winning and losing that can affect the outcome. But we always try to say to the athletes, if you can hop onto that ice and go as hard and as fast as you can, then we have the potential to dictate that play and shift the, the luck scale uh, over to our side with skill and speed. Okay, so do you, do you use like small-sided game type uh, formats to to practice that kind of thing? Yeah, mainly, um, you know, the way the practices are, the, the coaches have started to do a lot more small-sided games and small area games, um, mainly from a skill perspective. You know, just the way, less from, I would say, like a conditioning-based element and more from a skill, you know, skill in a small area, skill when there's pressure developing on you. Um, you know, we found that those small area games increase the intensity, right? The, the nice part about small area games is it's competitive. And yeah. athletes at high levels are competitive beings. And so, uh, you know, the small area games and the small sided games increase that intensity, which is what we want, right? That's, we've, we've identified mm -hmm. that as our, our key outcome yeah. measures. So, um, you know, our, our coaches do a lot more of that, uh, you know, have started to do, uh, incorporate that, which is great. Okay, what's the, okay, last question. What's the, the favorite session of the coaches, but the most hated session by the athletes? <laughs> uh, any time where they need to do that repeat sprinting, like uh, the okay. problem with, actually, it's not a problem. The, the thing with hockey is, is um, you know, the, the conditioning element of the game is very strenuous on the, on the lower body, like the muscular system. And so mm -hmm. any sort of repeat sprint, you know, the, the, the athletes always talk about their legs getting heavy and, and, and the conditioning element of it. Coaches love it. Um, you know, <laughs> my 